billowing smoke, the sun turned black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to meet God will be saved. Hallelujah. It's Pentecost Sunday. Let's stand up and everybody just clap your hands and praise God today. This is the day he made. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, praise him. This is why we're here. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Come on, you got to want it. You really got to want it. You really got to want it. Praise God. What is it that you need God to do for you? You don't really ever pursue God until you get into a place where there's something that needs to be done that only He can do. That's when you really start to generate faith. That's when you really, really, really find out how much you need God. When you get into a place that something needs to be done that only God can do. It may be your children. It may be something with your finances, your health. It could be any number of situations. But when you get into a place where you need something only God can do, that'll be the best place of your life. That'll be the place where you find God. That'll be the place where you find miracles. But, you know, we shouldn't have to get into impossible places before we discover our need for God. The wise person wakes up every day and realizes their need for God. The Bible says that God holds the breath of your lungs in His hand. He holds the breath of your lungs in His hand. That means every breath that you've drawn so far today has been in the hand of God. We need God. God kept you safe today. God may have saved your life this morning when you were on the highway. You have no idea, but maybe God did. We need God 24-7. We need God more than we realize that we need God. Today's going to be a great service. It's a great service because you're here. It's a great service because God's here. And I want to see God come in greater dimensions. I want to see God do incredible and great things. And I believe today He is. I believe that today He is. If you came in sick, I believe that God's going to heal people today. I believe with all of my heart God is going to heal people today. You came in here depressed and oppressed and all distracted. God is going to refocus your life today. He's going to reorder your life today. Some of you don't even know how out of order you are. Do you ever realize when you get new shoes how your old shoes were old? Come on, hasn't that ever happened to you? Or you get into a new car and you suddenly discover how old your old car is. The people selling you shoes and selling you cars are hoping, they're banking on the fact that when you see the new, you'll realize how old your old is. And sometimes we don't realize how out of order our life is until we see new order, until we see God do new things. And then we discover, wow, I was really getting stale. I was really getting old. I was an old wineskin. God's going to show new things to people today. I have no doubt it's going to happen today. Today's going to be a great service. We've got some people being baptized today. We've got a couple children being dedicated today. Amen. And I want you right now to enter into a state of expectancy. I want to say something about faith. My new definition of faith is expectancy. That's just kind of the one I'm working on now. It's too easy to say God can Anybody can say that. Expectancy says God will. And there's a huge difference between between saying God can and God will. Frankly, it takes no faith to say God can. God can heal. God can move the world. God can shake this. God can move on them. God, God can do anything God wants to. That's right. That's still not faith. That's a confession about God. Faith is when you take what is about God and you put it in your life. And you move from God can... To God will. Everybody say God will. will. And I feel like this morning we need to start with expectancy. 
I don't know what it is that you need in this service today. I don't know what it is you need in your life. I met with someone at the 9.30 breakfast that I have with people back here, and uh, she's starting her new job tomorrow with, with, with benefits, with, with uh, the work schedule she wanted. I talked to another person who got a report that, that someone was diagnosed with hepatitis C, that they found out that they do not have hepatitis C anymore. Amen. I don't know what it is that you need. I was on the airplane back from Puerto Rico this week, and there was a young man that came on, and he had lost his cell phone. He sat down, and you know his face turned white, and then he got back up, and he couldn't find his cell phone. He ran back out in the lobby, and they held the plane for him to get back in. They even made an announcement. Everybody look around your seat and see if you find a Galaxy cell phone. He, I, he was just lost, you know, I mean, sick about it. God spoke to me and said, tell him. It's okay, he'll find it. I'm telling you, within 30 seconds, he just happened to look over and the thing had fallen out of his pocket and was laying right beside his seat. How many people know that God's concerned about something that we may think is finding your cell phone? I don't know what you need today. I don't know what it is that you need, but I'm going to challenge you to get in faith, to get in expectancy right now. And I want you to tell God what you need before we start preaching, singing, doing anything else. I want you to tell God what you need. It may be something life-threatening like hepatitis, a disease you need healed from. It may be that you've lost your cell phone, your car keys. I don't know what it is. It may be a family member that needs saved. It may be, and I spoke with someone this morning whose family member needs saved. And we prayed for that family member. And I believe God's going to speak to that family member with all of my heart. Whatever it is that you need, I want you to pray and tell God and then enter into a mental state of expectancy. God, this service is the service for me. You're going to move on my behalf. Are you ready? Can you do this? Sure you can. This is not hard. Talk to God. Ready? Go. Tell Him. Tell Him. Close your eyes. Open up your mouth. Don't think it. Tell Him. Open up your mouth. Come on, some of you need to learn how to pray. Prayer is not thinking. Thinking is thinking. Prayer is speaking. Come on, open up your mouth. It's all right. It's all right. Open up your mouth. Talk. Come on, tell the Lord what you need. Tell Him what you need. Tell Him what you need. everyone here now just to lift up both your hands to your Father in heaven and just, just begin to say thank you Lord Jesus that you're going to do what it is you prayed. Thank him for it. Faith is praising God before you see it. We walk by faith not by sight. I praise you Lord for the jobs that people are going to get. God I thank you for the healing that's taking place right now. For the healing that's taking place right now. You might even want to check your body. You may be healed right now. I thank you, God, for the financial breakthrough. I thank you, Lord, for the people that are being spoken to, convicted, and moved upon by the Holy Spirit at home right now. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. We give you glory, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, everybody, just one more time, clap your hands and give him praise. Thank you, Lord. Stay in expectancy. Stay in faith. Don't sit down yet. We're, we're just about done, though. We're just about done. Now, Nikki may say something about it at the break, but Wednesday I'm going to talk about what it means when, when it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We need to have, we need to have an increased level of expectancy and faith for God to do miracles. Christianity is not Christianity if it's not a religion of miracles. It's not just doctrines and creeds and confessions. It is those things. But it is also the revealed power of heaven upon earth on behalf of the saints. So come Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We're going to be teaching on that. We do our full praise and worship. We have children's ministry going on. We have teen ministry going on. What time? 7 o'clock. When? Wednesday. Now, in this service, we have a 15-minute break. I say this for all the first-time guests. 
I'm going to be preaching here for about 30 minutes. And at that, uh, after that time, we have a 15-minute break. We take our offering. My wife will come up, Nikki. We'll take our offering. And then we have a 15-minute break. Anyone that's here for the very first time, if you are a first-time guest, over here in the corner is an area we call the guest lounge. During the 15-minute break, I stay back there, and I would like to meet you. So if you've never, ever been here before, I would love to have a chance to meet you just to, just to get connected. I'll be in that area called the guest lounge. If anyone has here, been here before and you're interested in joining the church or you've never been baptized or you're interested in getting plugged into ministry, you can go back here to the other corner called the members lounge. And there'll be people back there who will answer your questions about membership, baptism, that kind of thing during this 15-minute break. Then after the 15-minute break is when we'll do our baby dedications and uh, we'll do our baptism we have a praise and worship time and I, I, I believe today is going to be a very significant day this is Pentecost Sunday ladies and gentlemen and I'm going to talk about Pentecost right now amen look up to the screen everybody say this together ready I am blessed I'm blessed going in and blessed going out I am blessed in the bowl and blessed in the field I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the country my family is blessed and my home is blessed. Everything I put my hand to is blessed. Everywhere I put my foot down is blessed. Those that bless me are blessed and I am a blessing. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's Sunday morning. It's Pentecost Sunday. We got a bunch of wild, crazy people in this house today. Come on, how many people have been saved of a whole bunch? been forgiven of a whole bunch hallelujah do this for me before you sit down look around you 360 degree circle and welcome everyone that's sitting near you today and introduce yourself to them if you don't know them already I want to introduce or myself and welcome everyone that's watching online thank you for being a part of this service today we appreciate you being here we appreciate the fact that you're a part of the service thank you for being a part Today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day that we commemorate the Holy Spirit falling upon the 120 in the upper room. Today we celebrate the birth of the church. Can I tell you that the death of Jesus in and of itself was not enough to birth the church? It wasn't enough even Jesus to die and to rise again. That was not enough to birth the church. Jesus next ascended unto heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. But yet that was not enough to birth the church. The church was not fully birthed until Jesus died, He rose again, He ascended unto heaven, and what? Poured out the Holy Spirit. And today we commemorate that event. Just like we commemorate the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday today, Pentecost Sunday, we commemorate, we think about the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church. However, it's not just enough to commemorate. It's just not enough to celebrate. We need to experience. The good news is, is that the Holy Spirit wasn't poured out 2,000 years ago and then God's done. The good news is it just wasn't an experience for the 120 to experience themselves. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is to be enjoyed by every believer. The experience of the Holy Spirit is to be experienced, enjoyed, to be lived in by every believer. Of course, you know Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. If you have your notes, you can see that, that scripture written there. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
This was the day when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, fulfilling what Jesus had been saying to them. Now, it's interesting about the Holy Spirit because earlier when Jesus had been baptized, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and lighted upon his shoulders. Now, it was in the form of a dove, and that is a common figure or symbol of the Holy Spirit. Interesting that he didn't come in the form of a, of a blue jay, or he didn't come in the form of a cardinal, or he didn't come in the form, thank God, of a buzzard. He didn't come in the form of any other creature or any other bird except that of a dove. One of the things about a dove is this. You have to create an atmosphere or a habitat for a dove. This is really true of any animal. When you go to the zoo, do you ever see the habitats that they create for animals? There is a habitat that is conducive for penguins. There is another habitat that is conducive for lions. There is another habitat that is conducive for the reptiles. And all the different creatures in the zoo have a habitat that we have to create. And it's only when you create the habitat that the creature feels invited and comfortable to live. In our backyard, we had a, a couple of doves. You remember those doves? And it was just something about having those two doves living in our backyard. Nikki and I would look out the back door all the time. You know you're getting old when you start getting thrilled about birds. But we enjoyed watching those doves. And year after year, those doves were together. Year after year, they would sit right there on the deck that we had built around the pool, and they would sit there together. Year after year, they raised their young, and they kept coming back. And I was always careful to tell the kids, don't bother those doves. Because doves are, 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 doves are very finicky. They have to have not only the right environment for them to live, not only the right atmosphere for them to live, but if you mess around with that environment and that atmosphere too much, the doves will leave. You know, Paul said, don't quench the Holy Spirit. He also said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What I want to talk about today is the environment, the atmosphere that we have to create in our hearts and in our midst for the Holy Spirit to feel welcome. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit come, but it wasn't like the disciples were not ready. If you look up to the screen, you're going to see some scriptures that Jesus gave the disciples to prepare them for the coming of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 to 18. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, that is Jesus speaking of himself, and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. We see that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. This is why the Holy Spirit was very familiar to the disciples because they spent three and a half years entertaining the presence of Jesus. And it became a natural thing for them to continue entering, uh, entertaining the presence of His Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Notice the word that Jesus used in that, that, that scripture. It's, uh, it, it's translated here, helper. Some of your translations, the King James, for instance, translates that word, comforter. It's the Greek word, para. Cleat. Sounds like you're saying a pair of cleats. Paraclet, not parakeet. Paraclet. Three definitions, three ways that the Greeks use that term paraclete. Number one, they use the term to describe someone who would come and help shoulder a burden. Someone was considered a paraclete who would come alongside you and they would help you carry something. How many people have ever been moving something and you needed someone to come alongside to grab the other end of the couch? You've got a heavy burden. You're, you're struggling with it. You've got too many, too many things and not enough hands. 
and someone comes alongside to help. This is what the Holy Spirit is called in your life to do. The Holy Spirit of Jesus will help shoulder your burden. Do you ever feel like that your burdens are too heavy to carry? Do you ever feel like you're going to crumble under the weight of your burdens? Have you ever said, my life is just too heavy, this is too much for me? If you've ever thought that, if you've ever said that, if you've ever felt that, the good news is the Holy Spirit has been given to help you shoulder the burdens of your life. But I want to say, you must create the proper environment for Him. The second way that this word was used, it was used as, as an advocate, especially in the area of law in the Roman court systems. They would use this term to describe a, a couple of different ways, actually three different ways. Number one, a paraclete was someone who came and testified in your defense. Oh, come on, aren't you glad you've got someone on earth? who can testify to God in your defense. We know that Jesus does this. He makes intercession for the saints, but also the advocate, the paraclete, he also testifies in your behalf. It was used in the area of law to describe someone who would give you advice. For instance, an attorney may give you advice. He would be considered a paraclete. Have you ever gotten into a place where you don't know what to do? Have you ever gotten to a place this week where you had tough decisions to make? Do you ever wonder which is the right road to take? Let me ask you this. Has anybody ever messed up your life because you've made dumb decisions? There you go. That got your attention. Sure we have. We've made dumb decisions. We've made decisions that were not the right ones. In fact, I don't know even how you raise children without knowing the voice of the Holy Spirit. You can ask all three of our children how many times the Holy Spirit has woken their mother up and said, go check on them. You wouldn't believe the number of times that the Holy Spirit spoke to us and when our kids got home, we knew where they had been and what they'd been doing. It's not hocus pocus. It's not scary. It's normal. The problem is we've practiced such a powerless form of Christianity in the United States that we think now normal is somehow abnormal. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to tell us what to do, to show us what not to do. The Holy Spirit to give us insight. The Holy Spirit to show us decisions to make. This is how the word was used. In the Roman court systems, when someone would give you legal advice, here's what you got to do to make it happen. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. No, no, let me take that back. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. It's not a matter of whether God's speaking. Of course He's speaking to you. If you're born again, you're His child. The Holy Spirit's speaking to you. The only question is, are you listening? That's the only question. And so the other way that it was used in the courts of law is to describe the attorney who would stand up and argue the case for you, who actually would speak for you. Wow, isn't it cool that Jesus said what he said on the screen? I'll pray the Father, he'll give you another helper, one just like me because it is me, it's just me in spirit, not me in body. He may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, he'll dwell, he dwells with you, and he will be in you. How many people would rather have someone in you than with you? Are you, are, are you here today? I want to make this statement. I, I hope it sinks in. You are better off with the Holy Spirit than the disciples were with Jesus. I wonder what we're doing treating Christianity like it's some form of religion. It's like a club we go to once a week. It's just a cool place to hang out. You know, you you, you got the Rotary Club for that. Just a place to get together with good old boys and talk and laugh and have a good time feel good. You can go down to VFW and get that. 
Moose Lodge. We got something better. I know you think, man, I would love to be there when Jesus fed the 5,000. I would love to be there to see Jesus walk on the water. Jesus himself said, it's better that I go away. It's better that I go away. Think about it. You and I are better off with the Holy Spirit in us than the disciples were with Jesus with them. Think about it. The third way the word paraclete was used is to describe someone who would come alongside to fight with you in battle. Someone who was called alongside of you to fight with you in battle. Someone who will stand shoulder to shoulder with you. Someone who will not leave you. Someone who will not forsake you. Somebody who will say, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to live with you. I'm going to fight with you. Aren't you glad that we have the Holy Spirit? The precious Holy Spirit. Now, I want to go back to my original thesis. Think about this. We have to create an environment. We have to create an atmosphere. For the Holy Spirit to be in us, the Holy Spirit to be among us. But first, let's finish these scriptures. You can look to the screen or you can look down at your notes. John 14, 16 to 18. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Oh, that's the same one. Uh, batteries were changed on this this morning, right? Did it change? Yeah, I know, but I'm wanting it to move on. It's not doing anything. All right. All right, shut that down. Just shut, shut that down. Just shut it down. Everybody look at your notes. You got notes? What it says in John 14, uh, John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. This is Jesus preparing his disciples for the coming of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, Jesus said, but you can't bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. He'll take of what is mine, and he'll declare it to you. The normal Christian life that Jesus expected is a life filled with walking with the Holy Spirit, hearing the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit, knowing what the Holy Spirit is saying, entertaining the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will speak to you and help you make decisions. The Holy Spirit will give you strength when you feel like you have none. The Holy Spirit will direct your life when you've got tough decisions to make. The Holy Spirit will empower you for signs, wonders, and miracles. The Holy Spirit wants to do incredible things for you. It's not a matter of whether or not He's doing His job. He's been doing it for 2,000 years. The only question is, have we provided the kind of atmosphere and environment where He feels comfortable? <clears throat> and let me say, this doesn't come by accident. It comes on purpose. Number one, look down at your notes. These environments in particular, first of all, the personal environment... The first environment in the upper room was an environment of honesty and humility. Honesty and humility. We have to have in our heart an environment of honesty and humility. I believe the church probably has the toughest time with number one than any of these three. Where we're just honest and transparent. 
in the upper room that day, I don't think that there was any prima donnas. I don't think that they were arguing who was the greatest. When they were with Jesus, they were arguing who was the greatest. But in the upper room, I'm sure that they were humble and they were honest and they were open. There was Peter who said, what rights do I have? I've denied him three times. There was John who said, I laid my head upon his shoulder and declared to him in the upper room that I would never leave him. Who am I? I'm sure there was Thomas who said, I didn't believe anybody until I was able to touch the wounds in his hand and in his side. But all of the disciples and everyone that day would have to confess, I've left him, I've walked away. There was no sense pretending. There was no sense acting like they got it together. There's no sense acting like that they know it all because everybody in that room knew that they didn't. And oh, what a great environment to foster. One that is open, one that is humble, one that is honest, one that just says, this is me. This is why in the church the Bible says we must confess our sins one to another that we may be healed, it says in the book of James. And what is it about confession? It is the honesty. It's not that I want you to air your dirty laundry. It's not that you want me to air my dirty laundry. It's not like you want to know about me or I want to know your secrets. It's not that. It's about each one of us having an open, humble, and honest heart that says, here am I. I've got my stuff, I've got all my faults, and in that state of honesty and transparency, it creates an environment for the Holy Spirit. Number two, look down at your notes. Besides a personally crafted environment, there is a relationally crafted environment, and that means how we relate to one another. Number two, with forgiveness and community. With forgiveness and community. In that upper room, there had to have been some forgiveness. But you know, it's pretty easy to forgive other people when you've done the same thing. That's why it starts with honesty and openness. And that's why the second environment that invites the Holy Spirit is one of forgiveness and community. I believe that one of the great things that that just stops up the Holy Spirit from moving in our lives and in the church is because we have bad feelings towards people. We have unforgiveness towards people. The Holy Spirit wants to melt that away like Drano. The Holy Spirit wants to melt that away to where you have a flow again, the love of God in your heart. Where does it start? Number one, it starts with being honest with yourself, being honest with God. You ain't nobody. I ain't nobody. And number two, when we settle that, then we just start realizing, wow, we're just all in this together. Forgiveness and community. I need you and you need me. None of us are going to get get by by ourselves. None of us are Rambo. We're not going to do it on our own. And number three, the third environment. The third environment that invites the Holy Spirit to come is expectancy and worship. And this is what we talked about at the very beginning of this teaching. Expectancy and worship. You see, it's one thing to be honest and humble. That's great. It's another thing to be, to be um, forgiving and create community. But until we go to this third level of environment, which is expectancy and worship, this is the capstone that creates the environment in your heart and among us for the Holy Spirit to move. Expectancy and worship. That just means this. When you come to this service, what did you expect? What you expect is normally what you get. If you expect to be offended, for instance, you'll be offended. If you expect for something goofy to happen, you'll see it. If you expect to get nothing, that's probably what you'll get. But if you came expecting to get touched, you'll get touched. If you came expecting to get healed, you'll get healed. If you came expecting for God to speak to you, God will speak to you. Because your life will follow your expecting, expect, expectations. Expectation is just a form of faith. <clears throat> it is believing God, knowing what God wants to do in your life and believing God for that. And one of the things that we have got to do as a corporate body is every one of us, when we come together, we've got to have an expectancy. We've got to expect. We've got to know what we came for. It's just not enough to come and say, well, I'll just get what pastor gives me or I'll get what the worship team gives me or 
I'll just get some coffee because they'll give me some coffee. I mean, that, that's all good. But there's a level of expectancy beyond that, ladies and gentlemen, that will change your life. Can you stand back up with me? <clears throat> Let's just start with number one. I'd like for you to close your eyes and uh, just honestly and openly worship the Lord. Just honestly and openly, just worship the Lord. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. It's okay to know that you're a nobody. It's okay. It's okay to come to grips with the fact that you didn't read your Bible this week. Hmm? It's okay to come to grips with the fact that you didn't pray not one second this week. It's okay that you didn't pray for your pastor or your worship leader, maybe not even your kids or your husband. That's okay. Because right now it's not about that. The past is the past. You may have got drunk this week. You may have done drugs again this week. You may have cheated on your spouse this week. You may have done a lot of things. But you know what? None of that matters as much as this. Are you going to be honest about it to God? Are you just going to open up your heart to Him? I want you, want you to worship the Lord in honesty, in transparency. I want you to worship the Lord. Everybody, just worship the Lord. Because in this environment, God wants to move. In this environment, God wants to come in a deeper way. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Nobody's better than anybody else. No one's holy. The only one holy is Jesus. The only example we have is Jesus. The only one perfect is Jesus. Just worship him. Worship him. Open up your heart. Let the Holy Spirit now just begin to flood into your heart and in your soul. Praise God one more time. Good morning. I'm Nikki, if you're new here for the first time. I'm Pastor Mark's wife. It's good to see you all this morning. Thank you for coming. It's been a blessed morning already and better things yet to come. Amen. All right, if you would, just turn your attention to the screens, and we're going to watch some video announcements. going to be off the chain, off the charts this year. You need to be there, all right? July. Listen, start gearing up for it. Start getting in your mind. Take off vacation week. Do whatever. But start, as Mark said this morning, expecting. Start in expectation that, man, it's going to be good. God's going to do amazing things. I want to get my family here. I want to get my friends here. I want to get my coworkers here. Yes, God's going to do amazing things. So get geared up for that, all right? In addition, I want to just put this uh, thought in your mind, and we'll talk about it uh, more as we get a little closer, but we're going to begin uh, new signups for D12 in July. So that doesn't mean that the old signups and the old groups are going away. That means we're adding two, okay? 
So we want anyone that's not a part of D12, we want to get you plugged in. We want to get you involved. And D12 is our discipleship ministry where you join a small group and you're discipled by that person. And uh, it's amazing. We want you to be a part of it. So more to come for that. And again, I want to remind you, as Mark said, this Wednesday night, he's going to be teaching about miracle faith. So we want to be a part of that. Listen, Wednesday nights are incredible here. If you're not here, you are missing it. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, we've had amazing services. God's been moving like incredibly powerful, powerful. And we need you here to be a part of that. You need to be here to be a part of that. So listen, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, don't miss that, all right? All right, good. Thank you for that. And now it's time to give our offering, our tithes and offerings. And, and if you're new to Open Door and you're wondering, why is everybody clapping? Because we believe, we have a mindset, we have a mentality that it's blessed to give unto the kingdom of God. In fact, Jesus said it's better to give than receive, right? And so we get excited when we get to sow into the kingdom because we know that his word says that when we sow in, not only are we blessed, but that he gives back to us. And we don't do that as our motivation. However, God can't help himself. So when we give our tithe, which is our 10% of our increase, and God says you need to do that. When we give our tithe, then it comes back to us. When we give above and beyond our tithe in offerings, it comes back to us. Amen? Trust me, we have been tithing our whole entire life. I grew up in a family that tithed. When I was a little girl and I got birthday money, I tithed. When I graduated and I got graduation money, I tithed. And, and my whole life we've done that. We tried to instill that in our family, in our children. And I promise we are blessed. We've been, there's been times when I thought, God, how are we ever going to pay the bills? And God has never failed us. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. It may have seemed like it was a down to the last minute, but God always comes through. And I believe he honors our commitment and our sacrifice when we give unto him. So we need to give this morning. We need to give joyfully with a, a grateful heart. We need to give liberally. I believe we need to have an attitude and a mindset that says, God, I want to give everything I have. And I may only be able to tithe 10% now, but I'm going to make it a goal that next year I'm going to tithe 20%. I'm going to give, I'm going to give, I'm going to give. We can't outgive God. So this morning I'm excited for that. So if you're, if you're uh, making a check out to Open Door, you can just uh, write Open Door on it. If you're giving cash and you would like a tax deduction, at the end of the year you'll find an envelope in the seat in front of you. Just put your money in there. Sign your information, your name, your address, so we make sure that we can give those uh, documents to you at the end of the year. All right? Everybody stand up with me. <laughs> Let's bow our heads, and we're going to uh, ask the Lord just to bless this offering. As I do that, I'd like for the ministry elders and the ushers to come forward and position yourself around here. As soon as we're done praying, you can bring your offering up, and then we're going to have about a 10, 15-minute break. If you would like information about joining uh, this church, being a part of a ministry, about being baptized, anything like that, you can meet with someone back in the member's lounge. We'll have somebody back there to discuss this thing with you. And if this is your first time visit here, we want to remind you to meet Pastor Mark back in the guest lounge. All right? So let's all pray. Father, we just thank you for the word that's been spoken already, God. We thank you for the challenge in our heart to be living in expectation, God. We thank you, Lord, that today's Pentecostal Sunday and that you have more for us today, God. And we want to step into that today, Father. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give into your kingdom. We ask, Father, that everything that comes in, that you would take it and multiply it like loaves and fishes, that you would use it to advance your kingdom, to help this community, to touch people's lives. Bless those that are giving, Lord, this morning, those that would desire to give but have nothing to give, Lord. We ask your abundance upon them as well. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everyone say amen. Amen. All right, come on forward, and then we'll take our break.
Welcome to church. We are so glad that you're here. And we want you to know that when you walk through our doors today, you didn't just walk into a building. You walked into a family. And regardless of who you are, where you came from, or what you look like, you are welcome here. Because at this church, we believe that God is love. And that He is in the business of rekindling lost passions, restoring broken dreams, and filling empty lives. At this church, we believe that life in Christ is not a formula of rules and laws, but a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with Jesus. And His love is infinite and everlasting, without pretense or conditions or discrimination. At this church, we can't stand religion, but we love God. And if you're not quite sure what the difference is yet, we can't wait to show you. We're glad you joined us today. Welcome to church. All right, it's ready to, we are ready to start the second half of our service, and what's going to happen now is a couple of baby dedications. Cool. We love that. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> then we have three people who are being baptized. We're going to do that a little bit later. We'd like to get our, our worship time started because it kind of gets you energized and gets the atmosphere geared up a little bit. And then we have our baptism as a part of our worship. Not that it's uh, detached at all from our worship. And so we're going to have those baptisms here in just a moment. But Nikki, if you would, please come on up here. And, and uh, she's got the certificates. And uh, we're going to have the families come up one by one uh, for the baptisms. Or I'm sorry, for the baby dedications. Good. Thank you. All right. Ashton McGinnis. And bring the whole family up, by the way. I know you got some uh, relatives there, grandmas and grandpas, and maybe some aunts and uncles. Wonderful. Whoa, look at this guy. Man, step the, here. <laughs> oh, I'm looking for my mama. His new nickname is Linebacker. Look at him. Oh, he's beautiful. <laughs> Let's take him home. <laughs> Just for a day till nighttime. <laughs> All right. Well, introduce uh, your family that's up here to us, please. I have my mom, Joyce, and my dad, Ken. And then this is Ashton's sister, Eliza. Carissa and his cousin Kennedy, and then I also have my two friends that are taking the pictures, Amy and Sarah. <laughs> awesome. Well, when we dedicate, you are bringing this boy, just like Mary and Joseph did, to give to God. And uh, 
so you're following the footsteps of a good example. So you're dedicating this baby. But also, it's a dedication of the whole family because we're all saved. We're going to do everything we can to help her raise this baby boy in the fear of God. And it's a dedication of Nikki and I. It's a dedication of all of us in this room. Because as part of our church, we are their family as well. And so if the family today will do your part to raise this child in the ways of God, say, I will. And if the congregation, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or an usher, no matter what you do, if you commit yourself to be a blessing to this family, say, I will. And now, Nikki, if you would, please just say the dedication prayer over this baby. Yeah, I, I um, Amber just does a beautiful job. I think she's not on, here. I think she's on vacation this week. But she, um, she makes this little, it looks like a bookmark, and it's got the baby's picture on it, which is precious. I'm sure she got that on Facebook. Yeah, because we see all those pictures all the time with them. And, uh, but she put this scripture, which is just beautiful. It says 1 Samuel 1, 2 through 28, and I won't read it all, but this particular passage says, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. I mean, I just think that's real significant. That, that Today is a significant event. And even though we enjoy parading babies around, and they're beautiful, everyone wants to look at them, but it's a significant moment. Because you're really saying, God, you've given me this child, and now I'm giving him back to you, meaning I'm giving you free, complete access to do whatever he wants in his life, whatever you want to do in his life. And I'll do the best of my ability, as we all will, to line up with that word of God and see that fulfilled in his life. And it's an exciting time. It's exciting. So, uh, Lord, it's with a joyful heart uh, that we dedicate with Sharma, this child, knowing, God, that you have great things in store for his life, God, that before the foundation of the earth was ever formed, you knew him, you had a plan for his life, and God, that today is the beginning of, of that plan, God, that, that from this day forward, Lord, we all agree, Lord, that we're going to walk with Sharma, we're going to encourage her, we're going to lift up her arms as she leads and guides and directs him into the exact life, the path that you have for him, Lord, and we believe, God, it's a good life. It's a, a great destiny for him, Lord. And I believe even just his, his physical presence, Lord, if, as Mark said, just a linebacker, God, that there's a warrior spirit inside of him, that he's a fighter, God. And you've made him with tenacity, with, with strength. And, and that may be challenging sometimes, Sharma. Um, he's probably a baby who doesn't sleep a lot, and, and you may get worn out and challenged, but that God's put that spirit inside of him and that he's going to use it to advance the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we dedicate this child as we do all of ourselves, as we stand here, God, knowing that great things are ahead of him. We just ask you to bless the whole family, Lord. Give them strength. Prosper them in every way imaginable. In Jesus' name, we all pray and say Amen. together. Amen. Amen. <laughs> He's conked out now, though. How about baby Lane? Come on up here in the family, please. We have one more Lane Fravel. Is, is baby Lane here? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. You guys ready to worship? Amen. Amen. Come on, the Holy Spirit's in the room. You can worship God. Come on, come on. Everybody stand up to your feet. It's time to worship God. Oh, this is the moment you've been waiting for. This is why we've been preaching. This is why we've been doing what we're doing. You didn't come here to watch me get blessed. You came to get what you came to yes. get, right? Come on, everybody stand up. Let's praise and let's get ready. This is why we're here. This is your time. This is now your time. This is your time. This is when God speaks to you, when yes. God touches you. Oh, come on. Yes. Come on, put it together. Come 
say, Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Say it again, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good.
you shout in this house? No, no, I said shout. Today, I tell my friends, my family, the world, that the old Adam, the old Jimmy, the old Crystal is dead. I have been buried with Christ. My sin is gone. Nailed to the cross. And paid for. By the blood of my Savior. Of my Jesus. Today, I declare that by God's relentless, unfailing grace, I am forgiven. I am free. I am you. All right, all right. You know what? It's every Sunday is a good Sunday to get baptized, but but Pentecost Sunday is probably an extra special day. Uh, we got three people that's going to be baptized today, so uh, celebrate with them. All right. Amen. My name's Kelly Wood, and I can't wait to start my new life with the Lord. Kelly, because of your profession of faith as Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. My name is Keegan Arledge. Um, I'm here with my wife, Brittany, my bride. Um, I just want to take this time to, to praise the Lord and, and thank him for allowing us to be here together. And uh, I know he will bless us in our future. of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Brittany, because of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Come on, let's thank him. Come on, church, let's thank the Lord.
Somebody ought to praise him. Come on, take about 60 seconds. Clap your hands and lift up your voices and praise the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're welcome in this house. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voices.
up those hands and say, we will give you honor, we will give you honor, we will give you honor. Now let your voices be lifted up and give the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. Come on, lift your voices. He is worthy. Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all Deserve the glory. Sing it, church. Sing. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. From you are all things, and to you. Sing a little bit louder to him. You are worthy. You're worthy of it all. We 
You deserve the glory. Hallelujah. 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 You deserve the glory, Jesus. stand in the glory of the King, knowing that you're here, you have set us free. You're here, let our worship be your throne, amazed by who you are, your presence makes us whole. We stand in the glory of the King, knowing that you're here. You have set us free. You're here. Let our worship be your throne. Amazed by who you are, your presence makes us
morning the Lord hears that cry and uh, I want to tell you a story and I don't think I've probably ever told this publicly I've told it maybe in small groups um, I even shared it with our staff this week and uh, Bryce really prompted me because he said you know I've been a part of this church for many years I've been a part of your family for many years and I've never heard that story and uh, and I felt kind of regretful that I had not shared that and uh, so I went to bed last night, and the Lord woke me up at 5 o'clock this morning, and um, he woke me up with a dream, actually, and then he told me to share this story, and you need to hear this story, because you need to understand that there's a level of supernatural living that God wants to get us to, and, um, and not only that, but there is something that's stirring in the atmosphere. I feel it all over my body. My, my whole body is numb right now, and um, that's just the Holy Spirit moving. And um, listen, we are at the verge of God breaking loose. And I don't even know what that looks like. And we've been here so many times before. But to say that something is coming that we've never had before, we've never experienced before. And it begins, first of all, individually. And then secondly, it spreads out to the corporate. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost that we celebrate, that we acknowledge today. Is that it happened individually and then as a whole. The whole room was shaken. The whole earth was shaken. And it was spilled out into the streets. And you need to hear this story. It was about four years ago, and I was invited um, to do a conference in England. And, uh, and at that time, I traveled extensively. I was gone most weekends for probably about two and a half years. I traveled almost nonstop all over the world. And I was invited to go to England and, and to do a conference and every time I left, it was so difficult because I'm a mother at heart and I'm a, I'm a wife at heart. And to leave my family and to leave my children who were younger at that time was always such a challenge. It was always so difficult and I didn't have an international cell phone. So when I would leave and go away, I didn't have any way to contact me, to contact my family unless I would call Collect. And um, so it was always very lonesome for me. I would be invited to these places and I knew usually no one most of the time, they didn't even speak my language. But this particular time, I was invited to England, and, and I went to England, <coughs> and I'd done um, some services in London, and then I had to go up north. 
in the Manchester area. And so um, I took a train. That was the way that they told me to get to London, or from London to North. It was easier and cheaper that way. So I went to the train station and I bought a, tra a train ticket. I'd never been on a train before other than like maybe at some, you know, zoo or the fair or something like that. But I'd never been on a train like that. And, um, and so as I walked up, when you stand in, in the uh, terminal and then they, they announce your train is boarding and you immediately go, it's different than boarding an airplane. You go yourself and you get on the train. And so I'm walking out with my luggage, pulling my luggage, found my, found my platform. And there the train is stationed right beside me. And I looked at the train and blazed across the side of the train was written in cursive letters, big, glory. The name glory, the train's name was glory. And I had on sunglasses and I took my sunglasses off and I put on my glasses because I wanted to make sure I was reading that right because we've always pressed God for the glory. We understand the glory is the, the manifest presence of God revealed in our lives. And so when I took my glasses off and I put my, my reading glasses on and I saw it as plain as day, glory written across the side of the train and I chuckled to myself and, and I had these conversations with God because I didn't have anybody else to talk to. And, uh, and I said, God, you're so funny. I mean, just think, you've put me on the glory train. And I, I boarded the train and I found my seat and I sat down. And I still just kind of kept on this little dialogue with the Lord, you know, God, you, you, you put me on the glory train. That's so funny. I can't wait to tell somebody about that. And, uh, and right at that moment, the Lord began to just download in my spirit his words. And he told me, he said, you need to hold on because I'm launching you into the dimension of the glory that you've never experienced. And this glory is going to cover the earth. And the Bible says that his glory will cover the earth. And that glory is distributed through his people. It doesn't come down out of the sky and light pass. It comes in us and then we distribute it. And so at, at that moment, as he's speaking that to me, the train begins to take off. And it's not like a chugga, 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 chugga. I mean, it's like launched like a rocket out of that place. And it, it speeds up to like, I don't know, it felt like it was going like 200. I mean, it was fast. And the whole way to this journey, the Lord just kept downloading stuff about his glory and his presence and what he wanted to do here in this place. So as time goes on, I, I arrive on my journey and, and I am put in a monastery. It was an old monastery that had been converted to like a conference center. And so I go to this monastery and, and I began to minister that day. And, uh, and I said to them in the of course of my uh, my message, I said, you know, you know, I'm talking about the glory. And I said, you know, the amazing thing was they put me on the train that, that said glor the glory train. And they all looked at me and was like, what? And they were shaking their head and like they were kind of talking amongst themselves. And, and I said, yeah, you know, you name your trains. And this particular train's name was glory. It was written on the side of it. I mean, I saw it with my eyes. And they said, no, 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 no. We don't ever name our trains. There was nothing written on the side of that train. But I tell you, with every breath within me, without a shadow of a doubt, it was written supernaturally by the hand of God, the finger of God, glory on the train. Without a shadow of a doubt. And if I'd have had sense, I would have taken a picture of it. But I knew God was saying something. And so as the days progressed, the conference grew and grew and, and progressed. And one particular day, I was terribly homesick. And I didn't have any way to call home. And there was a payphone in the lobby of this monastery. And it was dark and dingy. I mean, it was a monastery. No luxuries, no nothing. And, and I, I saw a payphone and I thought, I can call home. And I called home. And I don't even know if, Mark, you remember this, but as I called home, I was trying to get the operator to, you know, do the collect call. And for some reason, the connection wouldn't go through with the operator, but I could hear him speaking on the other end. And I could hear him saying, hello, hello, hello. And my heart was so heavy. I was so homesick for that voice, for that place. And so finally, I hung up the phone because it wouldn't go through. And he didn't have any way to call me, of course. He probably didn't even know it was me. And I went back to my room, and it was a little dingy room, and, and, and no criticism against them by any means, but, but it was not the Ritz Carlton. And I was homesick, and I was sad. 
And I said to the Lord, I said, God, if you've called me to do this, then you have to give me something that I don't have because this is hard and I'm homesick. And as I stood in that little tiny room, all of a sudden, and I'm not kidding, and you may think I'm nuts, but I tell you, it's all biblical. And it's how well, God wants us to live at the level that I'm going to tell you. And at that moment, the wind began to blow in my room. Now, there weren't any windows open. There weren't any doors open. There wasn't any fan because it was hot. And in that moment, the wind began to blow. And all of a sudden, I could feel my hair like blowing out back from my hair, off my hair, neck. And all of a sudden, this power of God wrapped itself around me. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus said that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So understand there's a level, there's a dimension of the Holy Spirit in us. When we get baptized with His Spirit, the Spirit of God comes in. But there's a dimension of being upon us, which is different. It's for the sake of ministry. It's for the sake of others. And at that moment, something wrapped itself around me, the Spirit of God, in a way that I had never experienced before. And I fell to my knees and, and I stayed in that position for, I don't know, an extended period of time, just basking in the presence. In fact, my very breath, the way I breathe, changed supernaturally. Something changed on in me and on me. So after a time, I had to get up and make my way back to the conference center because it was time for me to go and, and do preaching again and, and teaching. And, and so I stepped out of the room and the, the presence of God was so strong. And I don't say this to boast. I don't say this to give myself any glory. But I say this because you need to understand if it happens to me, it can happen to you. I'm nothing special. I'm nothing different. I'm just a vessel that said, here am I. And so as I stepped out of the room, there were people from the conference, but not only from the conference, there were other people there that weren't even Christians. And as I stepped out of the room and started to make my way down the aisle way, down the hallway to, to the conference center, I'm not kidding. There were probably 15 people in the hallway. And the moment I stepped out and began to walk, every single one of them fell out, passed out in the spirit, flat out on the floor. I mean, I'm looking around like, these people are out. The power of God, the presence of God. So I, I carried on with the meetings, and, and 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 it was all powerful and good. And and the meetings ended, and I and I boarded a train from Man, or a plane from Manchester to head back to Columbus on a Wednesday morning, knowing that when I got here, my husband was in in Dallas doing a conference, and I had to come here and do the the church service that night, our Wednesday night service. And I was tired. I mean, when you pour out, like I was the only speaker at a very long, long 10 days that I was there. I was tired. I was exhausted. I missed my family. I wanted to go home. I wanted to see my kids. I didn't want to come to church. Come on, you've been there. I know you are because sometimes I don't see you here on Wednesday night. So I know you've been there and done that. But I was picked up at the, church, at the airport and I was driven straight here to the church. And as we began to worship, the Lord began to stir in my spirit. Everything that had transpired there, I was intended to carry. And not so that I could be lifted up or that I could be glorified, but so that I could spread what he had done. So we began that service and, and all I can say was that God's presence moved in such a way that we had never experienced it ever at this church or in my lifetime. I mean, the glory just was powerful and it was different and it was freeing and it was clean and it was pure and it was moving and it was so God. And we did the service and, and God did amazing things. There were people that were healed supernaturally. There were people filled with the spirit, people saved. I mean, all kinds of things on a Wednesday night. And at the end of that service, I remember standing up there. This wasn't here, I don't think. I can't remember. But I remember standing up there. And I remember the Lord prompting my heart and saying, will you ask them to come back again tomorrow? 
And I remember my heart racing because I thought, oh God, what if they say no? What if nobody shows up? What if you don't show up? And then I said, but what if you do? What if you do? And I couldn't run home and call Mark and ask his opinion. I knew it was just upon my shoulders to decide. And, and I said, okay, I just need to say this. I just, I feel like God's just saying, will you come back? And I said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be here tomorrow night. And I know God's going to be here tomorrow night. And that episode launched us into about a four-week revival. You've heard about the revival. Probably there was, there was countless people supernaturally healed. I mean, amazing healings. Amazing healings. Salvations, deliverances. God restoring people's hearts and knitting relationships back together. People filled with the Spirit. People empowered. And for weeks that went on. And then, and then we felt like as though it, it was not to continue and it didn't linger. And so those series of services ended. But I never have forgotten. Ever. Not one day in my life. What that was like. And I don't know that we'll ever enter into a series of services again. We may, we may not. I don't know. But I can tell you with everything within me that something in the supernatural realm is coming that we've yet to experience and we've got to be ready we've got to prepare ourselves we've got to prepare our hearts but first of all it has to begin in you and in me and in you and in you and in you and in you and you and individually and how appropriate God is so smart because how appropriate that he would choose today Pentecost Sunday for me to share this story with you because what it is is a dimension of his power and his glory that I didn't have I didn't operate in but I sure as everything within me needed it and so do you and that prompted the spreading of his fire and glory I don't want to duplicate that. I don't try to go back and re-resurrect that. I don't try and go back and make that happen again. Because the Bible says old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. But I'm telling you, something new is coming. And it begins individually today. And if you need a touch from heaven, like I described, you need to come up front. If you want God to saturate you, if you want God to infuse upon you, if you need a touch from heaven like you've never had before, we're going to ask the Lord to do that for us. Just like I said in that little tiny monastery room. Now don't come up because everybody else is. Don't come up because you feel pressured. Because this is you seeking the Lord. And it's your life that's going to walk it out. I'm, I can't walk it out for you. Pastor Mark can't walk it out for you. But if you're hungry, if you're desperate for a touch, if you say, God, there's something that I need that I don't have. I need you to change me. I need you to breathe on me just like we were singing, breathe on us. I need a dimension of your presence, a dimension of your glory that I can't even imagine. I can't even articulate the words. Then this time is for you. And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to do that for you. And I know he will because he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He says, if you ask for bread, I'm not going to give you a rock. And if you ask for fish, I'm not going to give you a scorpion. Jesus changed my destination. The Holy Spirit transformed my life. And we acknowledge the presence and the dimension, the third person, but certainly not the least of the three of the Godhead, and that's the Holy Spirit today. We acknowledge you, Holy Spirit. We acknowledge that you were sent from the Father through Jesus. 
We acknowledge that you are the promise of the fullness of Jesus to come. And we acknowledge that you have something that we don't have. And yes, you may have filled us before, but we need a new filling. And we need a new outpouring of your spirit, not only in us, but upon us. God, we ask for an outpouring for a distribution of a manifest presence that we carry with us. That when we enter a room, people are affected. When we pull on the grounds, people are affected. When we open up our mouth, the people are affected. And God, we lift our hands to you right now in a total surrender to say that here am I. And I need that touch. I need that breath. I need that dimension of your spirit. Breathe on us now. Change us. Prepare us for your glory. Make us a suitable carrier of your glory. Come, Lord. I believe it would be fitting to the Lord. If you have a prayer language, you begin to speak in that language. You begin to pray in that language. For those of you that don't understand that, it's exactly what was written, (laughs) that we read about in the scriptures. It was on on the, the video about Pentecost. And there are two types of prayer language or tongues as we like to say it. Maybe you've heard it called that, but it's when someone speaks a language that they're unfamiliar with. But also there's a language of heaven. That the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the Bible says that it's the Spirit of God in us giving utterance to words and and sounds that we don't understand. But in the Spirit, it speaks mysteries. In the Spirit, it communes with God the Father. And the Bible says out of your belly flows rivers of living water. And I declare to you, from the greatest to the least, from the youngest to the oldest, from the left to the right, the front to the back, that there is a new level of dimension of the Holy Spirit coming upon you now. Woo! And I declare to you that out of your belly flows rivering waters, and everywhere that water touches it springs forth life. And it's not bitter water, it's sweet water. And it's not decaying water, it's not stagnant water, it's not sour water, it's not swampy water. But it's good, clean, fresh, life-giving water. Oh. Come upon us now, Holy Spirit. Breathe on us, God. 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 We're hungry. We're crying out for you. God, we don't want to miss the moment of visitation. We don't want to miss the hour of visitation. God, we make a place for you in our hearts. We make a place for you in our lives. I make a place for you in my schedule. Because I just don't want a visitation. I want a habitation. I want you to come and I want you to stay. I want you to stay longer than four weeks. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Whatever you need from God right now, I believe in faith that he's doing it. Not that he's going to do it, but he's doing it. Right now, he's restoring lives. He's restoring hearts. He's he's, he's giving forgiveness. He's touching bodies. He's freeing minds. He's healing your body. He's healing your mind. He's healing your soul. He's empowering you. He's filling you. The 
this just isn't for adults. This is for the teens, guys. This is for you, fellas. This is for you, gals. of the Holy Spirit and anointing that's coming upon you. It's coming upon you to begin to flow even greater in supernatural ability. To flow in the keyboards, to flow in, in worship. You're going to begin to, to write more songs. There's going to be songs just birthed out of your spirit. There's going to be songs burst out of your experience. There's a level of power, Kyle, that God wants to bring to you. As I was pondering, as I was sharing this story, I couldn't help. I just felt like the Lord just kept saying that, that you're destined for that. You're destined for that. We're kindred spirits. And I just pray that, Father, <laughs> that there's just an infusion of a new level of supernatural ability a new level, a new dimension of the Holy Spirit and fire. Kyle, your, your heart is, is stirred for more of God. You're pressing God. You're saying, God, I want that. I want that. I'm watching videos and I want that. I'm hearing stories and I want that. You're not here by accident. Everything in your life has lined up according to the point to get you to this place. The good, bad, and ugly. And isn't that what God does in all of us? My past is so ugly. My history is so ugly. Some of you know it. It's ugly. It's disgusting. It's shameful. But because of that, I am who I am. And because of your experiences, you are here today. Kyle, I see you as a work in progress. And you've been a, you've been a lump, you were a lump of clay. First of all, let me just tell you what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that you were a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful vessel. But I saw that vessel begin to crack, and then I saw it begin to shatter. And your life began to fall apart, and it was painful, and it was horrible, and it was remorseful. But when it was all said and done, I saw you laying on the floor, and you, were, you felt like, and maybe you even said this to the Lord, but I'm nothing but a lump of clay. The beautiful vessel was gone. The shininess is gone. The attractiveness is gone. But I want to tell you in that moment, you were more beautiful to the sight of the Lord than the finest piece of pottery ever fashioned by the, by the greatest masters. And I saw that you've been in a process and God's been renewing that lump of clay and he's been fashioning you and he's been forming you. And he's bringing you to a point just like all of us were in progress, but he's bringing you to a point where you've never been before. And this time, <laughs> this time you're different inside and you know it, you feel it. All the things that we chase is gone. All the things we think will give us satisfaction and, and joy is gone. But there's a hunger inside of you for only God. And he's not disappointing. I just pray, God, for newness. Increased power. God, that tangible anointing that I talked about, that when he walks, God, that people experience your glory. When he opens his mouth, that people experience your glory. And the Lord's making you strong for the endurance, Kyle. This isn't short term. What God's going to do is long-term. It's enduring. He's giving you strength for that. Father.
God, your power is here. God, I pray that you make this church great. God, I pray that you make Pastor Mark great. God, I believe that you have made Pastor Mark and Nikki great. God, I pray for greatness on the body that's represented here today. And I pray, God, that the power of God I pray, God, that your power, that your power, God, would come upon us, Lord, to change our world. John Pinson, I pray for the power of God would come on your life and would change everything about who you are. God, I pray that the greatness that you've spoken, that you put inside of John Pinson from the moment he stepped into this body, from the moment that he became committed. God, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon him and to empower him, God. I pray, God, that you would change his mind. God, I pray that you would begin to form his mind, God. You would begin to shape his mind, God, into showing him, God, who, you, who he truly is who you've truly created him to be. John, you've often asked for the power of God and that you want to experience it and you want to see it and it's here right now. God, I pray that the power of your power, God, would pour on his life, would change his wife, and that they would lay up an inheritance for their children, God. God, we ask that you create a movement in our church. God, that, that you create a movement inside of our hearts. Let me tell you something. The power of God is already in you. The power of God is already laid up within you. But sometimes it gets locked away because of our own fears and our own doubts and our own past and our own history. But the power of God is locked up inside of some of you. And God wants to release that power. God, we pray that you would open our hearts. God, we decide, we choose to open our hearts, God. And we ask God for movement, for greatness. It's your spirit, God would remain upon us and never leave. We petition you, God, that you move through us in every way that you have possible, in every way, God, that you've determined, in every way, God, that you see fit, God. Move in us, move in us, yes. shape us, form us, mold us, take us, and make us who you've called us to be, God. Let us become fully alive to your presence. Let us become fully alive, God, to who we are and to who you've called us to be. Let us step in to the purpose that you've laid out for us individually and corporately, God.
pour out on your sons and daughters your fresh living water. Lord, fill this place with more and more of you. Into fresh anointing to break the yoke of bondage. Let us live our lives holy. sons and daughters your fresh living water Lord fill this place with more and more of you into a fresh anointing to break the yoke of bondage let us live our lives holy unto sons and daughters your fresh living water Lord fill this place with more and more of you into fresh anointing to break the yoke of bondage let us live our lives holy unto you open our see you now in your strength and glory in this final hour with young men see the visions the others dream the dreams Lord come prepare your people make way the king for sons and daughters your fresh living water Lord fill this place with more and more of you into a fresh anointing to break every yoke of bondage let us live our lives holy unto you open our the heavens pull your spirit out on a hungry people who are waiting now fill us to overflowing surround us with your cloud we are waiting on you to pour it out sons and daughters your fresh living water let us feel this place with more and more of you into a fresh anointing to break every yoke of bondage let us live our lives holy unto you pour out on your son your fresh living water Lord fill this place with more and more of you into fresh anointing to break every yoke of bondage let us live our lives holy unto you
for you. So I wait for you. I'm falling on my knees, offering all of me, Jesus. For your arms, they're open wide. Lord, I'm weary, but I know just one touch restores my life. And so I wait for you, Lord. I wait.
Mark wants me to sing this. I'm not a singer. You know that. <laughs> we want Kyle to sing it, but Kyle doesn't know it. And I said, oh, poop. <laughs> I know, I'm so bad. So I'm going to sing it once, and then he's going to get it. <laughs> he's going to sing it. You guys know that song, you remember? We sang it at that revival. We sang it like every service. So all you guys that sing, you remember. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in this place, God of mercy, love, and grace, saturate my soul. You are welcome in this place, you are welcome in this place. God of power, love, and grace, saturate my soul. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in this place. God of power, love, and That key? That's fine. That's my key I know. <laughs> it better be that one. I don't even know what key that is. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in this place. God of power, love, and grace. Welcome 
of power, love, and grace, saturate my soul. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in this place. God of It's important for us to be sensitive, and this is practice. This isn't the game. This is to give us, it's to give you practice in sensing the presence of God. Because you're going to need that. You're going to need it at work. You're going to need that to go to school, back home. And to be led by the Spirit, Jesus says, is like wind. You ever see people... You know, lick their finger, hold it up. Maybe that just gets their wind. Or back in the old days when we played on grass football, we'd throw the grass up and see which way the wind's blowing, figure out which way we wanted to kick or receive. So Jesus said that those who are filled with the Spirit, we, we, it's just like wind. And it's important that we're sensitive. It's just when the glory of God comes in. And it was just like Jesus walked in over here at this side just a little bit ago. Wasn't it, Todd? You see, the glory of God is the manifested presence of God in a particular place at a particular time. And it was it was it was about a six it was like a six foot spotlight that wasn't it, Todd? Todd followed me. And it was well what it's gone because I, I was just going where 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 it was going. He where he was going, I should say. But it was like it was like a six-foot spotlight was there, and it just came over here for a little bit. And then it jumped right over there, and then it was gone. And you'd like to think that you could make it come back, but you can't. It's just like those little, you ever see those little tornadoes? They're called uh, dirt devils, I think. And they just come, but you, you, you got to take advantage of the wind, but you can't make the wind blow. You gotta be sensitive. It's precious. And once you've tasted that, once you've tasted that, you're ruined for the rest of your life. That because it's like a little heaven. And then you have to go back and you do earthly things. I had to come up and tell Jessica that that their their little boy, little baby boy, he needed a diaper change. That's what I was doing up there. Trying to discreetly say, hey, you gotta go change your, your son's dirty diaper. You know, life life happens. You can be in the glory one minute and change in a diaper in the next. Yeah. This is precious. These are the things you tell your grandchildren. These are the times that become legend. Don't miss the seasons of God. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Do you remember what he said? You didn't discern the time of your visitation. So that's just meant to encourage you to embrace every chance you get. Every chance you get, embrace the presence of God and the glory of God. Amen. I just I want to reiterate the things that are important for our church. Wednesday night at seven. It's important. It's important. I want to underline our camp meeting. We haven't had camp meeting for the last few years because I just thought it got religious and mundane. I just, no, we're not going to do that. And I just sensed that maybe this year we needed to have it. So we're having camp meeting not to have it, not just to have a schedule. It, 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 it is to refresh and renew people. I talk, I mean, I was on the phone yesterday to a pastor. I talk to so many pastors, they're just ready to give up, throwing the towel. They're so discouraged. They're such an attack. 
such an assignment of the devil. I want pastors to come to our camp meeting. We're having our SOMA conference, so they'll be here. But I want to see them refreshed and renewed, encouraged, as well as spiritual leaders and families. Oh, so pray about that. Now, on, on Wednesdays, I have a Bible study downtown. I seldom mention it, but downtown at the Soma building, across from Schlegel's Coffee, at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays. No praise and worship, you know, nothing like that. It's just Bible. We get into the Bible. We'll be there for probably an hour and a half, asking questions, debating, talking, discussing. It is open to the public, 10 a.m. on Wednesday. And then we have a prayer meeting here at noon on Wednesdays. And frankly, there's only four people, five people maybe that show up, and that's about most of the staff, and they only come because I make them. Now, I know your schedules. I realize that. But if you can make it, say, but that's my lunch hour. We'd well, be ashamed to have to fast that lunch, wouldn't it? Fast and pray. So if you can make it Wednesdays at noon, Kyle has a little worship we do, and then we, we pray and we have communion together. And then Wednesday night. Don't forget camp meeting. We're going to be, I like your D12. Come up here and show off your Diva Warrior D12. Now this, this right here. Now I don't promise you everybody's going to get a t-shirt like this. Some of you guys wouldn't look good in it. But we're getting D12. We're going to sign people up. Thank you. Like right at the beginning, end of June, beginning of July, D12 to get, 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 get signed. Some of you are already there. You need to get re-signed up, recommitted. In the fall, we're going to have a 40-day focus. I wrote a book uh, about 363, 360-degree uh, discipleship. It's a 40-day devotional. And we're going to go through that together in the fall. That's the plan, at least. So good things are happening. Great things are happening. If you're here today and you didn't get a chance to, if you're a first-time guest, to fill out a guest card, please do that for us. And uh, if you want to join the church or be baptized, you can let us know back there. So if anybody's there, I don't know. People have kind of left, but that's all right. Jesus, we love you and we, we honor you. We thank you today, God, that you've chosen to show up and pour your spirit out a little bit. We just ask for more, Lord. We ask for more. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, just clap your hands and bless the Lord one more time. Have a great week.